Well, I believe God's got great things in store for us this afternoon, and we're delighted that you're here to be a part of that. It's been a real joy. Uh, yesterday we uh, met for the first time. We've spoken on the phone, but we met Emma and a colleague, Sam, and we have had a, just a tremendous 24 hours where God has just spoken into our lives. Um, we had arranged times for them to spend with various members of our team, and they have spoken so prophetically and so powerfully into so many of our lives already, and it's been really, really precious. And I just know you're in for a treat. I know you're in to be stretched today. And let me just talk to you about stretching. If you don't like stretching, you probably shouldn't have come today. <laughs> and to be honest, it's why you're here, isn't it? Because if it was all stuff you already knew, why have you bothered coming? It's because, it's because you need to, there's something in us that longs for more that's brought you here this afternoon. And so you're going to be stretched, but allow the Lord to help you in that stretching. So could you put your hands together and give a massive, massive Devonshire welcome to Emma Stark today. Emma. Well, hello, family. It's nice to be here with you. And we tried to get here in March, and then the snow uh, stopped us. Anybody leaving Scotland at all, do you remember that? And uh, I married a Scotsman, and we ran a ministry called Glasgow Prophetic Centre, as well as a church. Uh, but those of you, um, the canny amongst you will notice this is not a Scottish accent. <laughs> Uh, this is an Irish accent. Yay! And anybody heard the audible voice of God? You know he also speaks in an Irish accent. Okay. <laughs> okay. He doesn't really, just in case you think I actually mean that. Okay. <laughs> he doesn't. So, um, it is my joy to uh, train you how to prophesy. Uh, we've got three glorious hours together, and you will leave here prophesying better than you came in. There's a promise. Okay. So, uh, just... Uh, let me get a handle on where you are already. Who prophesies once a quarter? Okay, a few of you. Anybody prophesy every month? Okay, that's more of you. That doesn't make sense. Okay, anybody prophesy on a weekly basis? Fair few of you. Anybody think I prophesy every day? Sam definitely does. I, I pay him to prophesy every day. Anybody, anybody else? Okay. A few of you. A few, a, a few of you. Okay. Let me, Sam, do you want to jump up? And uh, this is Sam. He, he's worked with us for four years. And he's a sign and a wonder. He's a full-time prophet with us. And uh, if you get a word from him, you are very blessed. In fact, show us how it's done. Pick one and prophesy. Um, this lady sitting here with the black top and the long... You. Yes. Do you want to stand up? Fran, Fran, uh, I hear the Spirit of the Lord say this, just in the same way that the Shunammite woman created an upper room for the prophet to come and stay, so the Lord says you have given your life to create room for God to come and live, and live with you. And the Spirit of God says this, daughter, I have loved your violent, intentional pursuit of me and your presence and my presence, even when it cost you. And the Spirit of God says, I love the way that your first reaction to tragedy and difficulty has been to fall in your face. But the Spirit of God says this, there has been a weariness and an exhaustion that has clung to your bones even in recent weeks. And the Lord says, there has been a sense of failure and there has been a fear that you won't ever ascend to the high places. But the Lord says, I come right now, he says, with a sword and I am cutting off from you and dividing out from you the assignment of fear and the assignment of left 
lethargy and the assignment of exhaustion. And the Lord says, I'm speaking to your blood. And where there is even chemical imbalances that cause you to yo-yo, one minute you feel exhausted, the next minute you feel alive. The Lord says, I am bringing right and proper balance into that. And the Lord says, you will know life and life and life and life. And not the extreme tensions of toing and froing and toing and froing. And I hear the Spirit of God say this to you. Daughter, if you only knew what you carried, if you only knew what you carried, and the Spirit of God says this, I have trained you through tragedy, and I have trained you through loss, and the Spirit of God says you have understood how to cling to me when everything was going well, but more than that, you've understood how to cling to me when everything really wasn't going well, and the Lord says, see that you are well resourced, now to start to pour into other people's lives, and the Lord says this, I've given you away with words. Words, not just spoken words, but with written words. And the Lord says that there is an author on the inside of you. And the Spirit of God says, in this moment, I am calling it to wake up. And the Lord says, daughter, your writings, they will go not just throughout Devon, but throughout the nations. And the Spirit of God says, you will not just write from your own experiences. The Lord says, I am giving you creative analogies that will enable you to communicate truth to those who are younger, even to children as Emma was saying and the Lord says you will save children even from partnering with anxiety and partnering with fear and so the Spirit of God says this to you that you have had more victory over fear and over anxiety than you think you have but right now I'm making it final and the Lord says you are not going to fight that demon anymore but even as I stretch my hand out towards you right now in Jesus name we just kill once and for all that assignment of fear and every remnant of anxiety and we loose the author, we loose the author, we loose the writings that will go to nations. And God says again, daughter, if you only realize just who you were. Do you want to jump to your feet? I've just met you 30 seconds ago. Ty, have I got the right name? Okay. Do you want to lay hands on him? I heard the Spirit of the Lord say this, I have long called you Joshua. And the Lord says that you have been wearing a Joshua mantle, but it felt like you were the Joshua amongst the spies who first went out to scout the promised land. And the Lord says, you saw the enemy, but there has been a faith gift always in you that he could be destroyed, says the Lord. And the Lord says, you have surrounded yourself on many occasions with men who did not believe in the power of God God says the Lord in the way that you did and the Lord says I saw your heart many years ago that knew how big I was and that and that called you to leadership and the Lord says I put you in leadership development boot camp says God and I have put you on a training program says God to raise you from the Joshua of the the spies to the Joshua who led the people and the Lord says I want you to understand that I did not let some things happen happen and I did not let you own some things and I did not let some things come into your hand and it nearly broke you in the frustration but the spirit of the Lord says it was because I wanted to see what your heart would do when you did not have and the Lord says it was not the enemy it was my hand growing you up says the Lord and the Lord says you have passed the test says God when I withheld some things for you and now the Lord says I am dropping the the Joshua mantle fully over you says God and the Lord says to you leader arise leader arise leader arise leader arise and the Lord says your boldness and your courage I am giving back to you says God and the Lord says I want you to turn around to some relationships that terrified you and the Lord says if you will go and pick up the phone and reach out a hand of friendship the Lord says there will be instantaneous salvation 
nation, says God. For the Lord says, you put in words of truth that you thought were not heard. But the Lord says, they were seed words in their heart. And the Lord says, you had to turn away for your own well-being. But the Spirit of God says, if you were turned back, you will not follow them down their slippery slope. But the Lord says, they, you will be like a spiritual midwife. And God says, they will jump into the arms of their Savior, says the Lord. And the Lord says to you, yes, I made you for church leadership. And yes, I made you as a full-time Levite. And yes, I put a God call on your life. But the Lord says, I also made you for other nations. And you've been too scared to say that. But can we just acknowledge it together that you have a national call? This is because you locked yourself in a bathroom some years ago and you fell to the ground and you started to contend in prayer, says God. And I saw a moment of your desperation. Actually, you were there several times in a broken place. And the Lord says, I heard you. And I now answer your prayers with nations, says God. Do you want to add to that? Uh, and the Spirit of God says, just in the same way that I trusted Joshua with the land of running, flowing with milk and honey to feed the people, so the Lord says, in your later years, I will trust you with strategy to help solve starvation and, and impoverished and poverty nations. And the Lord says, you will implement strategies as a successful and respected church and national leader. And the Lord says that you will even cure starvation Starvation, even in the nation that your family was raised in. And the Spirit of God says, I am putting in your strategy, not just to tickle people's ears, but the Lord says to solve destitution, he says, even in your own home nation. So we let the violence of the kingdom that John the Baptist knew now come upon you because you saw violence used for harm. But the Lord says, I'm going to give you a forceful warrior, Holy Spirit anointing right now. And just as King David's mighty men, Eleazar and Benaiah knew and the others knew what it was to fight and to win, the Lord says, I'm going to turn around some situations and you're going to see successive victories. But the Lord says, you've got to partner with me, says God, and allow me to put a sword back in your hand. And you made a vow, I will be a man of peace, didn't you? And the Lord says, I want you to revoke that vow. It is not the violence that you saw, but it's the violence of an advancing kingdom. Do you remember Benaiah in scripture? He goes down into a pit on a snowy day and he fights a lion or, or Eleazar whose sword freezes to his hand in scripture. The Lord says, it's like them I want you to be. And I will enable you to kill the lions even in winter seasons. Amen. Wow. So we'll start where we always start, where I always start in teaching the prophetic. You get to practice as I go, and then we'll have a comfort break and a pause halfway through, and then we'll do some deeper stuff uh, in the latter part of our time together. Does that sound okay? So let me start you where I normally start. Have you ever wondered what heaven is like? You can talk to me. It's okay, guys. <laughs> All right. I'm not too formal. This is not from my own visits there or my children or my staff's visits there. This is just from the reading of the Word of God, what it tells us uh, from Ezekiel and uh, Daniel and John and others who were caught up to the heavenly realms. We know that Scripture tells us that there, is a, there are streets of gold, that there is a tree of life, that there is a river of life. And we know that the most important place in all of the heavenly and earth realms is the throne room of God itself. And the Bible tells us about the throne room that it is a very full place. It actually gives us a mathematical sum in Revelation 5 for how many angels are in the throne room alone. And it says there are 10,000 times 10,000 angels. How many is that? Somebody do the maths. A hundred million angels 
in the throne room alone. And if you arrive in the heavenly city and you are walking from the outside edge to find the throne, you would probably spend days with your GPS lost in the angel crowd trying to find, remember how how big some angels are, trying to find God and the noise of a hundred million voices singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. How breathtakingly beautiful he is. And when you would reach the center, you would find encircling the throne, the living creatures and the elders, 24 thrones, 24 elders casting down their crowns. And directly around the throne are the four living creatures. You know what scripture says, they have a number of wings, they have four faces, and they have eyes all over their bodies. And my children say to me, mommy, do they even have eyes in their armpits? Well, it says all over their body. And uh, obviously, we don't celebrate Halloween. But my daughter said to me some years ago, Mommy, do you think you could make me a living creature costume so I could go to the Halloween disco and terrify all the witches? (laughs) And then you would see a huge throne with somebody practically indescribable on it. Our God on the throne with the appearance of jasper and carnelian or diamond and red orange and glowing hot metal. In other words, he's very bright and a rainbow that also looks like an emerald circles the throne. And we read in scripture that the throne is deep blue sapphire. It is flaming with fire. Its wheels are all ablaze. Its foundations are righteousness and justice. And in Isaiah 6, the train of God's robe fills the temple. And I want to say, well, God, how big is your coat if it fills the room that a hundred million angels stand in? And there are clouds around him with flashing lightning, fire and brilliant light. A river of fire, we read, comes out from before him. And before the throne is what looks like a sea of glass, crystal clear. And there are seven flaming lamps, and out of the throne comes deafening rumblings and thunderings. You are now in the very throne room of God, the heart of heaven. If you thought it was a quiet, reflective place, you didn't read the book right. (laughs) Meanwhile, picture the scene down on the earth. It is Ascension Day, and that is the day where Jesus' body is leaving the earth realm. And Jesus, who has risen from the grave, is being enveloped in a chariot cloud that is transporting him back to heaven. And Jesus walks back into this throne room scene, and his eyes are burning with fire. And his hair is as white as wool. And his voice is the sound of many waters. And his feet are glowing as though they were in a furnace. He has a golden sash on his robe. And coming out of his mouth is a sharp, double-edged sword. And his face is shining like the sun in its noonday brilliance. It's the ascension moment, the moment of the re-enthroning of Jesus, his re-entry into heaven, where he moves to take his place at the right hand of the Father, and in a statement of his permanence there, he sits down. He has come home. He has returned. He is not bound to the earth realm anymore. And all power is his. And Ephesians 1, 21 says, Jesus is far above all rule and authority, power and dominion and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Now work with me. If you want to say par, 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 okay. 
to say it in an Irish accent for it to really count par. And Jesus' throne marginalizes all earthly thrones. His rule has supremacy over all thrones and principalities and powers. But then the most remarkable thing happens next. Jesus turns his attention back down to the earth realm. And the first thing Jesus does in that ascended place is give us gifts. And we read that in Ephesians 4 verse 8. When he ascended on high, he led captives in his... Who are the captives? What does it say? That when Jesus rose from the grave, all the righteous who had already died were raised to life too. Well, how many tens of thousands, if not more, were raised from the dead on the same day as Jesus floating around Jerusalem, terrifying people, waiting, (laughs) read the book, waiting for the ascension moment. So when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train. We believe some way out stuff, by the way. And he gave gifts to men. And at the point of the ascension of Jesus, we get handed gifts. Now, gifts of being an apostle or being a prophet or being a pastor and evangelist. But actually, prophecy, tongues, healing, faith, interpretation of tongues. And the gift of miraculous powers that's listed in Corinthians, which is different from healing because it's listed separately. Who's moving in the gift of miraculous powers? I'm not even sure we know what that is. No hands went up. I think that's probably like Jesus walking on water and walking through walls. And I have to say, when John... And John 14 says, you know, uh, because I go to the Father and send the Spirit, you're going to do greater works. And I'm like, stop the bus a minute, Jesus. Greater works. I would just like to match you because quite honestly, you levitate and, and you talk to dead men in a cloud and then you walk through a wall and I'd like to kind of match that and you say greater works. So gifts come from the most powerful place in all of the heavens and all of the earth that you might become enforcers of the kingdom. And we become, as we partner with the Holy Spirit and the gifts, directors of heaven on earth. And part of our problem is the way we have translated uh, the word charisma, which you read as gift, and one of the problems we have is that you, you see a gift as something, oh, it's a bit frivolous, it's really not sort of necessary, it's a dreadful jumper that your great auntie Maud bought you for Christmas, you know, something you'd really rather not own. And yet, a better translation, and some translators are now on it, are rather than spiritual gift, is spiritual enablement or spiritual empowerment. And actually, the root of the word charisma partly means to rescue. And when we understand that spiritual gifts are enablements and empowerments provided by God for us to manifest his kingdom, our attitude to them should radically start to change. And no longer should any of that gift list be seen by you as an optional extra. They are gifts to you the same way that guns and ammunitions and grenades are gifts to a soldier. They are divine empowerments to operate in the word and the power of God. So let me tell you some stories of what that looks like in just a regular life. When you know what's inside of you. In those gifts. So I'm shoe shopping. Who knows that's a really godly thing to do? <laughs> You're right there. Hallelujah, Jesus. And half of you are going like, no way. Okay, so I'm shoe shopping. I'm actually a Marks and Spencer's. And, uh, uh, and God says to me, go and prophesy over the lady behind the till. And I'm like, sure, God, I'll do that. 
So I walk up to her and uh, there's a huge queue behind me and there's checkout operators either side. And God closes the two checkups either side and the queue divinely vanishes and God orchestrates a moment between me and this young lassie. And I say to her, hello, my name's Emma. I'm a prophet. I hear from God. Now, that's normally how I introduce myself unless you're really annoying me. And then I say, I'm an exorcist in the hope that you might leave me alone. So, um, but if you don't tell people who you are, how will they make a withdrawal on you? Okay. So I'm a prophet here from God. And I just say to her, you know, I just hear God say, you are going to be a really good mum. Very short sentence of revelation. She starts to weep and she says to me, I have just discovered I am pregnant. I have not told anybody. I have not even told my boyfriend. And she says, I have an abortion booked for this Thursday. She said, I prayed for the first time ever in my life this morning that if God was real, he would show me what to do. And he says, she said this, if God says, I'm a really going to be a really good mum, I will ask for permission to come off my till and I will cancel my abortion. And that is exactly what she did. Come on, God. Normal life. Just normal life. So we were working in the psychic fair arena with the witches and the warlocks. I love that. And the New Agers and all the tarot card readers, they actually chucked us out and said our aura was interrupting with their... (laughs) Great. So actually, they, they would put us in the hallway. So then we got to prophesy to everybody before they went in and stop them going in. Or if they went in, cleanse them when they came out. So we were quite happy with that. Anyway... So this witch emails me and she says, I'm going to turn up and I'm going to curse you. And I'm like, yes, bring it on. Because like, what's that going to do? So she turns up and she's got this demonic tongue. And I mean, she's right in my face and, you know, slithering kind of snaky tongue. And I'm smiling at her and I'm like, I love to prophesy over you. So we sit her down and I mean, she just will not stop the curse. And I said to her, God, what do you want? me to say to her and he said you start repenting and you say sorry to her and you tell her that you are sorry for the way church treated her when she was younger and that the blood of Jesus was shed as much for you as it was for her so I'm halfway through this and she she now is crying a bit snottery and cursing and does not know which one to pick And so the Lord says, put your hand on her all-seeing third eye. So I'm in her space, which is a bit aggressive. And and God says, you say 10 times to her, why are you looking for the living amongst the dead? I'm like, okay, God. So we're on it. And my colleague, because we always work in teams, says to her, you have a tarot card reading book for this Wednesday, don't you? And when you go, Jesus is going to turn up. He's going to freak the tarot card reader out. And you're going to have a revelation that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And when that happens, turn up at this address and we escort her off the premises. (laughs) She goes to the tarot card reader, meets Jesus in the heart of the camp of the enemy turns up at the church on the address, falls to her knees as she comes through the door and gives her life to Jesus. And as she does it, her back is spontaneously healed of a long-term issue. The next week, an estranged relationship with her daughter is healed. The week after, inheritance that was robbed from her comes back. And the week after that, she starts the Alpha Course. Come on. This is just normal day-to-day prophesying. So I'm, I'm sorry I don't have boy stories. You have to give me grace. I'm in boots and I'm working with the woman who's doing the, you know, the makeup, t- you know, the foundation t- to see where I've got the right color foundation. All the girls are like, yes, I, I know that one. And uh, uh, I kind of feel like every dentist or hairdresser or shop assistant is fair game for a word of God. So She's saying to me, oh, what do you do for a living? I'm a prophet, I hear from God. And uh, you have to pick what you say according to what their need is. So like in Build-A-Bear Factory, I'm like, well, I'm a dream interpreter. Uh, Oh, I've got a dream. And we interpret and she gets saved, okay? So you have to know what to say so that they can make the white. This this time I'm a prophet, I hear from God. And um, 
she says, uh, what does God have to say to me? I have never met a non-Christian when they hear you are a prophet who did not ask that question. They are so hungry. If you were brave enough to say, well, actually, I hear from God for a living. Come on, come with me. So anyway, and I just say to her, I think you're really obsessed with grief. Uh, and the Lord says, if you'll come back to church and come back to him, he'll restore your joy. I mean, actually a very simple word. And she starts to weep and she's saying to me, oh, my, my sister died of breast cancer. Somebody else died. I cannot deal with my grief. I'm just caught in a, in a grief trap. And she says, if God says he's the healer of my grief, I am going back to him this Sunday. I mean, come on, buying makeup, buying so many so many stories I could tell you. Turn to your neighbor and say, what God has put in me will change lives. Now, I have to say, you didn't look very convinced and neither did your neighbor. Try the other neighbor, okay? What God has put in me will change lives. Okay. I was at the hairdressers and she's saying to me, oh, what are you doing in the summer? And I'm like, oh, well, I've got my 15-year-old daughter and um, we're trying to decide uh, whether to send her to China because she wants to smuggle Bibles into China, but <laughs> she's underage and it's illegal and, and uh, she hates Jesus, my hairdresser. And I think I'm going to lose an ear here because she's contorting her face like, you know, what do I say? And she really refuses to speak to me for the rest of the uh, appointment. But actually the word of God has gone out that we value Bibles. And uh, so I pay and leave and I go back six weeks later and I'm thinking, do I go back? Because I really irritated her just by giving a value to scripture. She sees me park my car. She is out the door of her shop, running to my car. And she's saying, did the Chinese get their Bibles? <laughs> And it is just, it, a complete, in fact, I then had to do deeper healing on her and then another one of her teams. And then I was, stayed there for ages writing decrees that they could pray because of their fear issues. And all that because even just a word of boldness, not even a prophetic word, hung in the atmosphere and changed the atmosphere. Okay. Has anybody heard of fracking or hydraulic fracturing? This is not a prophetic comment on it. Okay, you're wondering, where is she going? It, it, this is my understanding of it for illustration purposes. It's a controversial new way to deal with our impending energy crisis. And it is water under high pressure that is pushed into the ground with such force that it pulverizes the rocks and they release oil and gas that is trapped within. And sometimes you need a high pressured rush of the prophetic into your life to release what is trapped inside of you. And we have hard places in our lives that require prophetic people to do some fracking in us, to release and expose our hidden treasures. We all, I think, have forgotten dreams. We have unremembered callings and you need a fracker to bring them up. And I want to say to you, there is oil inside your rocks. We had a lady called Mar Marissa who came to us oh, some years ago now and she just felt like such a failure. She'd been on the mission field in Latin America. Her eyesight had failed her. She was still only in her uh, late 20s, early 30s, and degenerative eye condition. And she sat with, I didn't prophesy over it, with some of my team, and they said to her, remember you've got children's books in you. And she wept. And most people weep when they're prophesied over, not because you're being nasty to them, but they are remembering. They are remembering. 
And she said, I got in the train to Stirling. It was dark from Glasgow where we're based. She said, God played me an open vision out the, ca- out the window of the train of a little rag doll called Marigold and how she met with the love of God. She said, in the 25-minute train journey, I had the whole first book downloaded in my mind. Let me make this more scriptural. Jeremiah 23, 29. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and a hammer that breaks the rocks to pieces? Your word when you speak is like fire and hammer in the life of somebody else. And so the words that you release as a prophetic person, they will come to every place that the enemy has been building against somebody. They will come to the places of darkness and stuckness and pain. They will go to the places where devils have been grasping at people and they will break you out and set you free. And I want you to say to your neighbor, watch how you're pronounce this. I'm a prophetic fracker. <laughs> Before that goes on, I am a prophetic fracker. Okay. Tell your other neighbor, you're a prophetic fracker. What she says? <laughs> That's a cop like that. There is a warrior, forceful violence that has got to rise up in us to come against the rocks in other people. And the prophetic, let me be very clear about this, is not, oh, bless me, bless me, massage my ego. (laughs) Yet it will bless you. But prophets should not be about feel good words. Prophecy fundamentally is an instrument of war, and those who prophesy are warriors. You do not ever see in all of Scripture a prophet turning up and saying, Pat, Pat, there, there, well done. It's not the call of God. Now, there are other disciplines and calls in Scripture, the shepherds who turn up and hold and are interested in lifelong nurture. But the prophets and the prophetic people are those who are easily bored. <laughs> can, we, can we be honest about what this is? They are agitators and provokers. They have, to love, they have to love while they're doing it. You don't stop loving somebody. But they always want the status quo changed. And if that's your burning desire, there's probably quite a prophetic grace on your life. They are wired for holiness and righteousness more than most of the other calls of God and gifts of God. Because revelation impresses upon them and they feel it very deeply. And John the Baptist, who's written about what's he called the greatest prophet that ever lived, In Matthew 11, verse 12, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force or forceful men lay hold of it. And he just prophesies one sentence, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. But so immense is his prophecy and so great is the change that it brings that he grabbed hold of heaven and heaven suffered violence. That's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. And he lays hold of the ways of the kingdom of God, pulls it down by what he says and advances the kingdom of God in the earth. And there are words of prophecy in you that will literally grab hold of heaven and the kingdom of God at your words will also suffer violence. That's positive. And it will bring a needed interruption to the way some things are going. And God is saying, where are the John the Baptists of this generation? And where are those who will go as an advance raiding party into the kingdom of 
darkness like John the Baptist and they will speak revelation and all of heaven will back them up. Anybody facing darkness or a difficult situation? Okay. When all about says that you are facing an impenetrable issue, that there will never be a solution. What you need is a prophetic fracker to arise alongside you and break off the rocks of restriction and constraint. Let me be clear about this. Prophecy is not in the church a massage therapy. It is not a day spa. It is not a sticking plaster. It is the helicopter din mountain rescue team when you have got lost in the fog and you need put on the right path again. It's when the avalanche has come and you need dug out. And remember Moses who strikes the rock uh, in a barren place. Has any, anybody ministered to somebody who's an absolute barren mess? That you know that there is hope. And God has a strategy to release a forceful, powerful anointing on the lips of prophetic people to stand against what seems impossible. And what is in you is supposed to set free individuals. It's supposed to set free families and it's supposed to set free communities and nations. And so every time you prophesy, your first question should be, how free can I get you? That's the mindset of a prophetic person. How free can I get you? So in our ministry, what's banned is, oh, I just see a flower. <sighs> I'll just leave that with you. <laughs> that's, that's not a light. Instead, in my head, should be, how far can I transition you into the purposes of God by partnering with the Word of God? And that should be the default setting of anybody who wants to prophesy. Does anyone want to prophesy with an awoken warrior spirit? Does anybody want to rescue people for nations and the purposes of God? Jump to your feet then. You are going to practice in a minute, but I actually feel we need to probably start by repenting for downsizing our spiritual gifts. Oh, I'll not touch. Oh, that's the optional extra. Why don't you repeat after me? Father God, in the name of Jesus, I repent for each and every time, knowingly and unknowingly, that I downsized my spiritual gifts. I'm sorry when I didn't use what you gave me. Father, I want to partner with a new understanding of the prophetic. Can you put your hands on your tummies for me, please? And I'm just going to awaken the warrior within you. Now, you'll not warfare like, the, like an Irish woman will. You'll warfare like you warfare. But you'll still need to warfare. So in the name of Jesus, I speak to your sleepy warrior spirits and your passion that got dulled down. And I call it to awaken and to arise right now in the name of Jesus. And where you went off the ball, I call for a resurrection of your passionate, wild, undomesticated, untamed soul. Holy Spirit soaked hearts. And I say, warriors arise. Warriors arise. Warriors arise. Warriors arise. Come on, you tell your warriors, don't make me do all the work. Warriors arise. Warriors arise. Warriors arise in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Whoosh. 
now. How are you at shouting? I tell you why it's important. We don't just shout because we feel like it and it sounds like it might be a warrior thing. In, when the children of Israel are going around the walls of Jerusalem, Jericho, not Jerusalem, Jericho, wrong J, they release a cry. And in scripture, in the Hebrew, it's written as the word ruhwa, R-U-W-A. And that just doesn't mean they shouted. It is a particular sort of shout assigned to warriors that has the strength to break down walls. A ruhwa. Very often, my staff will roar over somebody who is really stuck with a ruhwa, and they will instantly get healed and come into their right mind. And not a prayer is prayed. We're just following the model of scripture, the ruhwa of Jericho. I actually felt like when I was praying for your warrior spirit, you only half believed it and you only half liked it. Just being honest with what I say. Prophets are quite direct and the Irish are direct, so it's a double whammy. I love you really. I actually believe you need to even shout over yourself and say, my walls of my passivity, I'm breaking them down right now because I am trapped in a wall of passivity. And I have lost the wildness that I used to know when I was even younger when I first got saved. And is there not a lie that when you grow up in faith, you, you stop the big dreams and you get a little bit cynical and a little bit disappointed? Anybody know what I'm talking about? And we think that's just what happens when we grow up in our faith. What about... If the older you got, the wilder you got. Come on. What about if those over 40 actually put those under 40 to shame by the wildness of the dancing and the wildness of the roar and the ability to know how to tear down an enemy that doesn't always sound very polite? So can I ask you again, do you actually want your warrior to wake up? Yes. Yes. It's a little bit better. Now, on the count of three, you're going to do your own deliverance ministry <laughs> on that. And you're going to shout over your walls of passivity and it will kill them, but it will also waken up your warrior. On the count of three. One, two, three. Yeah! I speak to every chain around your feet of passivity and I kill it right now in the mighty name of Jesus. And where you as a church in this region have got stuck and even bored and even held in a familiar place where you have not advanced and you have not taken territory and even new buildings have been hard to come by. We break where you have been held captive right now in the mighty name of Jesus. And I say over you, it is the day of forward movement and it is the day of momentum and it is the day says the Lord where I am putting fire on your feet and you will start to move again says God amen Whew, that feels a bit better you can have a seat well done can you get out pen and paper or something that you take notes on like a tablet or phone but something that you can write on I think Sam has some paper and pens in his hand. And let me give you some instructions.
Let's look at the key fundamental scripture regarding prophecy. 1 Corinthians 14, 31. For you can all prophesy, or King James Version says, all may prophesy. And while Paul states it, and we say, well, it's true because I've read it in scripture, I have a really hard time believing that this is truly for everyone. All may do it. And so I want to activate you by getting you to write a prophetic letter from God to you. And for those of you who have never prophesied before, welcome to the world of prophesying. We used to call this the entry level activation. You know, that you prophesy over yourself and then you start to prophesy over others. I actually believe this activation is the highest form of prophecy that there is. A heart yielded before God that knows the voice of God is the highest form, I think, of revelation. You see, I am interested in teaching you how to give a word. I am more interested that all of this region comes into a culture of revelation where you know what the voice of God sounds like no matter what age you are. You know when revelation hovered over the company of prophets that Samuel comes down the hill with to meet Saul who's looking for his uncle's donkeys that Saul comes into his right mind by standing next to those who carry revelation. They don't prophesy. In fact, the word of God says he prophesied and he became a different man. And could it be that as you start to steward revelation, you're not just giving a word, or you do that as well, but actually your crime statistics start to drop and your area comes into its right mind because it's in the shadow of revelatory truth that comes around a people who understand a culture of revelation. Whoa. So David and I, my husband, we've been married 20 years this August. I know I don't look old enough, it's great. And uh, we do this often. And you know, you know truth, but sometimes it's very hard to access. And we just write a letter to ourselves from God. And there are days where you would pay somebody, this pens and paper over there, some, you would pay somebody to be nice to you. Do anybody else have days like that? Just me? Or you think, I would pay somebody to ring me up and be nice to me. Okay? This is where God is nice to you all by yourself. When you need encouragement, this is what you do. Now, who hears God like he's William Shakespeare? <laughs> do not go weird on me, all right? What does God call you? You know that when you are really close to somebody, you probably have nicknames and pet names for each other, don't you? So God will have a name he calls you. Yes. So what does he call you? And so you write, dear, whoever you are. What's your name? Hi, Paul. Dear Paul. Or what, does God call you something else? Does he call you lion-hearted? I think he does. But okay, Paul will do for now. So, dear Paul, and then you start to write what God is saying. Top tip, don't reread it. You tend to construct it. Now, the other reason this is really important, I think one of the major problems we have in the prophetic movement in the nation is that people come and take the microphone and they do not know what God is saying to them personally because they've not done this. And they grab a mic and they bring a personal word for themselves, but they think it's a word for the people. It has done so much harm in the body of Christ. Agended negative words 
that are not for public consumption. And this exercise is one of the key ways to iron that out of the body of Christ. So when you come to the platform, you are full of the word of God for you. And you are so healed by what the voice of God does in a life. It will iron out your rotten agendas when you start to prophesy over somebody else. We have to grab the prophetic back and purify it from what it has done and the damage it has done. You know, we have to call ourselves to a higher standard of revelation. And can I tell you the difference? What's your name, my lovely? Nice to meet you, Louisa. The difference between Louisa and I is practice. The only difference is I gave myself to practice. That's the only difference. I bothered enough that revelation mattered enough to me that I was prepared to do it all day, every day. So that when a microphone came or somebody with skin on came, I already knew what to say. I didn't just want a platform. I wanted the face of God and his revelation before I wanted anything. All right? So pen and paper in your hands. Now, if you get stuck, just flick your hand in the air and Sam and I will will not talk to you, but some people just need a little bit of an impartation. All right? Fan into flame the gift of God that is in you through the laying on the hands. Remember what Timothy, Paul says to Timothy. So on your marks, get set. Anybody got any questions? Prophesy. Go.
another minute. So you can finish that off. I don't know how God talks to you. No, is he daddy? Is he father? Is he Abba? Let him finish that off how he is known by you. And then you can reread it. Now these things are often quite personal. So we're not going to force you to reveal what's written. But do we have a couple of folk who think, yeah, I'd like to volunteer and read what God has you don't mind, Heather. Go for it. Do you want to jump to your feet? And I've not done this before, so I'm quite nervous. But, dear Heather, I love you, my daughter. I knew you before the beginning of time. Your life was mapped out by me. The wonderful times, the times of grief, the family you were put into, the children, the grandchildren you have. Trust me, my daughter, I will not, will not leave you or forsake you. The plans that I have are for good and not evil. Open your mouth and I will fill it. Be bold, my daughter. There is a wellspring of life in you. Step out and I will take the lead. My promises for you are yes and amen. Your loving father. Amen. And how do you feel when you read it? Wow. wow. When we all go, yay, that just sounds like God. Yay. Okay, somebody else. Lady at the back, I'm going to come round to you. Come towards me a little bit. Your name is? Amy, okay, go for it, Amy. I can't quite believe what's come out. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> it says, Dear Amy, you're my daughter and I love you. I see you as white as snow. You are special to me. I will make you great among the nations to stand up and speak on my name. Many will be freed through you. You are an emerald, you are an emerald gem, and that is why the church saw golden rain pouring on your head. Go out in my name. Be brave. You have my strength and courage. I have called you to be to me forever after. You are a great encourager and bringer of life. My kingdom is yours, Abba. Whoa, and how do you feel when you read that? Very shaky. <laughs> Very shaky. I take that as a good thing. <laughs> okay. Anybody else want to read what they've got? Any boys? There's a boy. What's your name? Colin. Hi, Colin. Dear Colin, I say that you are about to step into everything that I have for you, that you have giftings that you have felt pressurized, but I say that these will flow separate from any agendas and, and preconceptions. I tell you that you will speak into people's hearts and show them how to sidestep the agendas and the conflict, but not in avoidance, but in a way that disarms. I say that you will be a speaker of truth and will respond to boundaries and obstacles with love. I'm showing you new... I, I'm showing you new ground and you will need to step away from every, all preconceptions and restrictions. Your open heart and humility will let you step out in faith. You are about to set a completely new paradigm to relationship to family which will be based on love and reconciliation. Wow, and how do you feel, Colin, when you read that? Quite emotional. It is emotional and, and it should be when God talks to his children. Well done. Okay, good stuff. So the best advice I can give you is do that frequently. And if you want to be good at prophecy, that is homework for you right there. That you take that and you do that at least once a week so that you are flexing your revelatory muscle, all right? Who thinks they could do that? Yeah. Yes. I'm actually working with a church in Ayr up in Scotland and they've been doing this once a week. Uh, I think we're on five months. The difference of 10 minutes once a week of proactively hearing from God has radically changed their revelatory paradigm. Okay. So let's look at some other scriptures. 1 Corinthians 12, 31, but eagerly desire the greater gifts or earnestly covet the best gifts. And then you turn the chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1, desire spiritual gifts, especially prophecy. And one translation says, zealously lust. 
test. And you have to say, does that not sound ridiculous? Does it not even sound greedy and desperately unbalanced that you've got to covet, zealously lust, and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially that big one prophecy? And too many of us have spent life with a false humility preventing us from, oh, you know, I'm just a worm. And I, I can't have those big whizzy things from God. And which one of you wakes up and says, God, I'm lusting after your gifts today? Who says that in the morning? Okay, it's not in our vocabulary, and yet it's in the vocabulary of Scripture. May I suggest that you all know how to lust? You've probably done it wrong once or twice. You need to sanctify it and point it in the right direction and say, I'm lusting after spiritual gifts. Let's try that. Now, some of you weren't so keen on that, probably because it offends the religious spirit. So in a bid to chase the religious spirit out of the room, let's have another go. I'm lusting after spiritual gifts. I'm lusting after spiritual gifts. <laughs> okay. Now, my, our prayer should be, oh God, I don't want to miss a moment. I want to see all you've got for me. I want to sense the moving of your spirit. I don't want to miss a thing. And normally we say, well, if God wants me to have it, it will turn up in my life. Or if you're very spiritual... He predestined me before the foundation of the world. It's going to turn up. Or like my Northern Irish granny says, what's for you won't go by you. But you have got to get over your false humility and stop saying, I'm not worthy of anything and start to be aggressive about some spiritual issues. And I have three children, a 15-year-old, an 11-year-old, and a 10-year-old, a girl and two boys. And on Christmas morning, they do not wait in their beds and say, brethren, do we have a witness to get out of bed today? They are straight down the stairs like little rockets. And they do not stand solemnly around the Christmas tree holding hands, agreeing truly that mummy and daddy are good all of the time. <laughs> They just dive in and they open presents and they open presents that don't even belong to them as long as they're the biggest. And the Bible doesn't say, oh, only desire the little gifts. The desire says, you, the Bible says, you make sure you switch on your desire and you make sure it's for the best gift there is, the gift of prophecy. Jacob and Esau, Romans 9, 13. Jacob, I have loved. Esau, I have hated. I don't think there's any other record in Scripture of God saying he hated somebody. It's a very severe Scripture. And Jacob is the one who deceives his dad. He goes into cuts with his mom to rob his birthright. And you say, surely God, you can't rock up and say, that's the one I like. Jacob was so consumed with spiritual blessing and spiritual authority that he was willing to do anything to get it. And although it is offensive to our well-heeled, well-meaning conservative with the small c Christianity that likes to sit still in church, and it offends ideas of proper behavior and motivation. God loves the heart of a human being that is prepared to go hard after spiritual blessing and spiritual authority and spiritual gifts. Jacob, I have loved. And my father, he's a Baptist pastor, a Northern Irish Baptist pastor. I'm fourth generation preacher. Do you remember in the days of the, the overhead projectors? And he would write out that song. It total heresy, by the way. I seek the giver, not the gift. Do you remember that nonsense? Where is that in scripture? I seek the giver and the gift. I challenge you to desire spiritual gifts. Can you put your hands on your tummies for me again? I loose in the name of Jesus a hunger for spiritual things. I 
reawaken your hunger for gifts and spiritual blessings right now in Jesus name and we break that false maturity and that false humility that says oh I'll just hang around and wait you don't have time to wait around anymore and so I loose back to you hunger in Jesus name can you jump to your feet can you find somebody that you don't know very well this is easier done. Somebody you don't know very well. Somebody you like the look of. Come on, you're going to have to move around. Work with me. I'm on the move. I'm on the move. Oh, I need a fan. It's so I need a fan. It's like, oh my <laughs> If you have not got a partner, can you put your hand in the air? And can you walk towards somebody who also has their hand in the air? And find a partner. Anybody not got to... Nobody, lock the doors. Nobody's allowed to hide. This is... You should be going, Yay, I get to practice. Okay. So. Okay. Tell your neighbor, I give you permission to practice on me. No. It's the mummy. Shh. You are going to tell your partner who they are like in scripture and why. Sam will demonstrate this for you in a minute. Who are they like in scripture and why? This is an easy one to start off because most of you know a scripture character. Can you not do what I heard somebody once do when we did this? You're just like that prostitute in scripture. <laughs> That one who married Hosea? No, 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 no. No, no, no. And we're going to stick with Bible characters. Uh, one church woman said to me, I just saw my friend like that guy in scripture. You know, the one who shot the arrow really straight, William Tell? <laughs> like, no Bible characters. Okay. And uh, what I would like you to remember is that boys can be Mary's. And girls can be Elijah's. All right. Sam, do you want to show us how it's done? Okay, this guy here with the chain and the dog tag. Yes, you. Yes. Uh, <laughs> if that's what it is. Uh, so the Lord calls you a Daniel. Uh, and the Spirit of God says this to you, son, I have trained you in some unconventional environments that you wouldn't pick for yourself. But the Lord says the same way that I gave Daniel favor with those in high places, even though he lived the life contrary to their laws and their principles. So God says because of your purity and your pursuit of me in the middle of some situations where you didn't, where you're choosing to live according to the kingdom, despite influence from outside and influence from those those who are above you, God says to you, son, I will give you favor in high places and I will give you favor in places where you wouldn't get favor normally just by acting yourself. And so the spirit of God says, do not despise the environment you're in right now to get trained because God says long term, you'll look back and be thankful that you consistently turned up and were faithful. So you are not allowed to say, oh, I just see Pontius Pilate, and I'm just going to leave that with you, okay? You have to tell them why. And do you remember, you are fighting for them to see how free you can get them. Now, before we prophesy, we always pray in tongues. If anybody does not pray in tongues, you need to see me. You cannot prophesy well without the language of heaven already in you. And we go to the book of Jude. And what does Jude say? Build yourself up in your most holy faith by praying in the Spirit. And other scriptures say you prophesy according to your faith. If your faith is low, you jump into Jude and you pray in tongues and it gets built up. The more you pray in tongues, the better you prophesy. Biblical truth. We pray in tongues so much. I've even been in Tesco's and picked jam off a shelf and turned to the check, the, one of the girls who was stacking the aisles and gone, Kiamana Shelia Manakana, and thought, oh my goodness. 
<laughs> that actually happens a number of times. But you, like, Paul, like Paul says, I, I'm glad that I pray in tongues more than you. Or Ephesians 5, pray in the Spirit when? Occasionally? Pray in the Spirit on all occasions, all of the time. All right, Ephesians 5. Okay, so we're just going to pray in tongues because we're going to build ourselves up. If you don't pray in tongues yet, just say, Jesus, help. <laughs> or start praying in tongues. I'll help you later. Oh, I'm stirring up my faith. Oh, I'm stirring up my faith. Oh, then I'm going to go quiet. Shh. I'm going to start to hear what God is saying. Who they're like and why. I'm going to open my eyes. I'm going to look at my partner. And we're going to number ourselves one and two. Come on. That's the easy bit. One and two. One and two. Can we do one and two? Okay, number two, it's your blessed moment. You are starting. Number one, you are receiving. So number twos, on your marks, get set, prophesy. If you are stuck, you need to raise your hand and Sam will fix it. You may need to give us a minute. Anybody else stuck? You need to wave at me. Oh, there's loads. Okay. else has got their hand up uh, swap over if you've already done swap over Now, we're not going to get round everybody, but you have a go, and we'll get to you next time if you're still stuck. Wave at me if you need more time. Another 10 seconds. Okay, have a seat. (laughs) 
You can have a seat. I'm sorry, we didn't. Uh, I don't have enough of team with me to get to everybody. You can. So, Amen. You can have a seat. Amen. <laughs> now you've got started. I can't stop you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> So, show of hands for me, who was blessed by what was spoken over them? Oh, well done, you lot. Good job. Good job. Who was shocked by what came out their own mouth? Top of the class to you lot. The aim is that you're shocked by what comes out your mouth. See, if I'm prophesying, and I already know how God signs, I already know he said that to somebody else, and I'm kind of familiar with that way of prophesying, I'm not growing. Now, don't lie to me next time I ask and say, oh, I was shocked. I'm growing, Emma, okay? But the aim is that you are going, oh, where did that one come from, okay? That you are shocked by the degrees of glory by what comes out of your own mouth. That's the aim. I was shoe shopping. I know it's another shoe shopping story. <laughs> Got quite a lot. I don't own a pink pair. That's neck or a yellow pair. But anyway, 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 let's not get started. And if you've ever shoe shopped with children, uh, you know, like they boing around like Zebedee, you know, and uh, mine are particularly high energy. And you could just see on the manager's face, like, get them out of my shop. So we're standing uh, and we're about to uh, pay and I am really harassed. You know that, like children, you just are mortifying me right now. You, you know when really well-behaved families come to church and their children sit impeccably and you just think, why did mine never do that? Okay, um, so, so I'm not focused on a holy moment at all. I'm just like, can we just get out of here? But I see that the, the manageress is in pain. And I say to her, I really feel like you're in pain. And she said, yes, I've just been diagnosed with this really for, rare form of arthritis. And I'm like, yes, hallelujah. You know, so I'm like, I'm going to pray for you right now. And so I grab her hands and I pray. Now, unusually for me, I'm praying quietly into myself. And uh, her staff start to gather round, and the queue start to gather round. And I've now got this massive audience in the shoe shop. And she says, are you a Reiki practitioner? And I'm like, no, I am not. So I tell her, I'm sorry, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And she says, what are you doing? What are you doing? My hands are tingling. And I say to her, the Spirit of God says that you have bitterness in your heart against your mum, and you hate your mum. And it has brought the arthritis to your bones and if you would follow me in a prayer of releasing forgiveness to your mom God says he will heal you on the spot right now and that is exactly what happened actually my friend went in to invite her to an alpha course the week after come on on the spot but I was really highly distracted that day. Another day, you probably all wake up on time and everything is beautifully measured and even paced in your house. I woke up one morning and I'm like, run, everybody run. You know, that, that, that way. And I'm running down the hill and I'm firing my children into the local nursery. I was actually, um, I was going to say I was selling drugs at the time. I did sell drugs for a job. Pharmaceuticals, it was legal. It was legal. And actually, I sold Viagra for years. I did. But now I raise people up in a completely different way. So, don't you? I know, I know. Sorry. I know that's so bad. Right, right, right. Come back, Holy Spirit. So, so, sorry. Uh, right, right, right. So I'm, I'm, I'm selling Viagra and I'm firing children again. And it's not a Christian nursery. I don't um, even really think the woman knew much about me, apart from that she occasionally, you know, was the one in charge of my children. She called Miss Tricia, and she is just sobbing. And I'm not a shepherd or a pastor, and I'm like, of all the days to be upset, you know? And, uh, uh, and I'm trying to find the inner shepherd. And, uh, uh, and she says... I've just been told that I'm completely infertile and I'll never have children. And I'm like, really? Now you're telling me this? 
so I have a moment to fix it before I'm going to be late. And I just say to her, children are a gift from God. It's got nothing to do with what any medic has ever said to you. And in the name of Jesus, I loose the gift of God, the seed of life into your womb right now in the name of Jesus. And she looked stunned. I looked stunned. She didn't even know I was Christian in that moment. And I'm like, see you later. And off out the door. (laughs) Genuinely. And I come back later. In fact, three months later, she comes to me and she says, Emma... I am miraculously pregnant by the hand of your God with twins. Actually, that's happened quite a lot. The whole infertility thing. Uh, And the reason I tell those, what then happened was we lost contact with her. And when my young, we moved house, when my youngest, Samuel Elijah, went to school, I saw Miss Trisha in the corner of the playground and her twins were in the same class as my youngest child. Amazing. Why do I tell you those two stories? Because I was not in a a really holy moment on either of those. In fact, I was quite harassed on both those occasions. And 2 Timothy 1 verse 6 says, I remind you, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God that is in you through what? The laying on of hands. And another translation says, you stir that thing up. You arouse that thing from dormancy. It is your responsibility to wake up the gift of God that is in you and you are not to wait till you feel prayed up or fasted up or till you have some Holy Spirit goosebump moment but you are to start to plug in and you are to stop operate start operating and the gifts of God are not based on how you feel in any given moment they are based upon your choice and your will as an individual to believe and act And sometimes when you are exhausted, you can still say, yes, I have got a word for you. And when I was managing a pharmaceutical team in Scotland, I'd driven to this girl's uh, patch, pharmaceutical patch, and I was there as her boss to tell her off because her work was really substandard. And I had in my mind, this is a correction, this is a, a, a work disciplinary meeting. And I get into the car beside her and... Um, she says to me, uh, I know you're Christian, um, can you interpret a dream I've had? I'm like, this was not the plan for today. I wasn't going to do the Christian lovely thing. And uh, so I'm like, yes, fine, I'll interpret your dream. So I'm interpreting her dream and it's a really revealing a crisis in her marriage. And she says to me, Could you come to my house right now? My husband and I are devout Muslims. We hate Christians. But I think, as you interpreted that dream, you've got the answer to restore my marriage. Can you sneak into my bedroom and bless my bed? And I'm like, right, okay. I'm sure this is outside of the constructs of a working day, but I'll do it. So I sneak in, bless her whole house and lay hands on her bed, call her intimacy and her marriage back into order and leave before her husband comes home. She rings me later and she says to me, Emma, um, my husband felt a change in the atmosphere in our house and wanted to know what I had done rather than divorce me he came in and felt like he fell in love with me again instantly on the spot and she said I had to confess that there had been a Christian bless our marriage his mother was then dying uh, a few weeks later and he rung me up and he said, you know, we don't believe she's going to be healed. She is dying. I just loved what your God can do. Do you think you could bless her on her deathbed? And I turn up and they're all in the Muslim prayer room. Uh, The whole family are praying to Allah as she's passing over. And she's been a devout Muslim all her life. I clear with my friend the intensive care unit and say I just would like some moments with her. She is in a semi-vegetative state. 
and the nurses say, you will not get any movement at all. Don't expect anything. So I just start to sing about Jesus over her in her dying moments. And I say to her, I'm holding her hand, but of course it's all limp. And I say to her, would you like to receive Jesus Christ before you pass? And miraculously, this woman squeezes my hand. And that one moment of me saying, yes, I'll interpret your dream, saved a marriage and had another soul in heaven. Come on. And so the Bible doesn't say, when it says stir it up, fan it into flame, it doesn't say beg or plead. It says you've just got to start operating in what is already in you. And part of our problem is that we come to prophecy with an Old Testament mindset. Now, in the Old Testament, there was no indwelling Holy Spirit. So in the Old Testament, prophecy is received. Oh, I'm getting my antennae up. Where are you, God? Where are you? Oh, there. Oh, I'm receiving a word. That's how it worked. You walk across into the New Covenant and the New Testament, you do not receive prophetic words. That's not how it works. Because you have the indwelling spirit. And do you remember what the scripture says? He who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. So you know when you get saved, Jesus doesn't go into your heart. That's heresy. But we understand why we say it. Where does Jesus go at the point of your salvation? Into your spirit. And your spirit and the Holy Spirit are one spirit. So you are not receiving a word. You are perceiving the voice of God that already dwells in you. It is a completely different spiritual thing. And so one day, I'm, we've done a conference and I'm just lying on the settee and I'm saying to I'm so tired. And David's gone to pick up the children. And I say to God, don't talk to me. I just want to sleep. You ever had those days? And God says to me, go to the nail bar. And I'm like, I hate nail polish. Uh, on my, I can coat with my toes, but not my fingers. I'm like, why would I want to go to the nail bar? I don't even have a nail bar. And the Lord says, get in the car and drive. So I'm in the car and I'm driving. And he says, go to that one. And I stop and I go in. And I'm like can you do my nails like really quite resentfully about the whole thing? And I say to the lady, tell me your story. And she says, my parents ran the most strict mosque in Tehran. And she said, I'm degree educated, but was never allowed to tell anybody. I've written a book, but I couldn't tell anybody. And we were allowed one activity as a female devout Muslim. I was allowed to go to a choir. And she said, somebody in the choir turned up and put earbuds in my ears and said, you'll like this song. She said it was a worship song about Jesus. She said, I knew on the spot that Jesus was true and I gave my life to Jesus before the song had ended. And she said, I went home to tell my husband, knowing that I may be put to death, and he said, did Jesus have women? Because he had been secretly concerned that Muhammad had had nine and 11 year old women. And when he found that Jesus did not have women, he gave his life to Jesus on the same day that his wife gave his life to Jesus. They then told her father and mother. Now at this point, nobody is having eyebrows done or nails done and everybody is gathered around. I feel like I'm interviewing this woman. And she says, my father called for the secret police or whatever they're called to have us arrested and dealt with. She said, but my mother had secretly also accepted Jesus when we told her about him. And she 
gave us a phone call and we got out of the country, went to the airport. She said, we landed in Liverpool and we went straight to Liverpool Cathedral because we didn't know where else to go. And they gave us a Bible in Farsi and she said it was her most precious possession. The council had rehoused her three weeks before that in Glasgow and she'd got this job in this nail bar and I said to her God told me to come here today I am in Christian ministry I'm a full-time Christian leader and she just grabbed me and she sobbed and she sobbed and she said I knew God used women she said I have just never met one that he used and I asked him to send one that I could ask what it was like to be a woman that Jesus used so many stories I'm going to give you a comfort break before we change tack a little bit here I am no different from you I just practiced Hundreds of stories. Every day somebody gets prophesied over. It's not once a quarter. It's not once a week. It's not even once a day. It's multiple times a day. Everywhere I go. So jump to your feet. And I'm going to release courage and boldness. And then you can take a comfort break for five minutes. And then we'll come back. Father, I thank you that you made us part of an army and that your desire is for my courage and boldness to return. So in the name of Jesus, I loose back to these dear family members their courage. And where you... Oh, let's just deal with your silence. I think you're going to have to repent for being silent, where there were times where you could have and should have spoken and you did not. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Some of you actually have, yeah, there's a number of you. Some of you have actually carried that even from childhood abuse or even bullying in school where you believed, yeah, there's a few of you nodding at me, where you believed that your voice wasn't valuable. Yeah, a few of you are waving at me. Okay, let's just deal with that. I know some, this goes to some deep places. But we're going to repent for our partnership with it. So do you want to repeat after me? Father God, in the name of Jesus. I repent for each and every time. Knowingly and unknowingly. That I partnered with silence. I'm sorry where I did not speak. And I'm sorry where I did not believe my voice had value. Now, that really goes deep. We're going to do mass deliverance. And I'm going to call that spirit of silence up and out of you right now. The spirit that has held you is a spirit. That means it is breath or wind. That means spirits come out on the breath, doesn't it? So I'm going to get, don't go weird on me or hyperventilate. You are just going to take a, take a deep, deep breath. And in a minute, when I call it up, and you are going to blow it out on your breath. And that spirit of silence will leave you. It is the only time in church you're allowed to yawn or burp. Or even fart, though I didn't say that in the house of God. That spirit, wind, spirit has got to come out. I don't really mind which end it comes out, as long as it comes out. Welcome to Mass Deliverance. It will not make a noise and it will not do you any harm because I'm going to tell it to. We do not do Hollywood histrionic nonsense in deliverance. It is not allowed. If you get stuck, 
wave and Sam and I will come and kick out. It's really important that the church in this region gets her voice back. Really important. Okay? So I speak. Hey, you spirit of silence, you stand to attention and you look at me. Don't close your eyes, anybody. This has to be done with eyes open. And you look at me, and in the name of Jesus, I bind you, and I call you up and out on their breath, quietly and cleanly, and you spirits of silence, you may not harm them or do any more in their lives. And right now, as they blow out, you come out on their breath in Jesus' name. So take a big deep breath, and out comes the spirit. All of that spirit, of, now you may need to do a couple of times, every spirit, Come on, blow it out. Every spirit of silence comes out. Good job. On the breath. is men and women. It's not just the women that have been shut down. It's both. There has been such a sense of, of that owning you for so long. Now, anybody feel it stuck? Let me just walk to you and... Okay, I'm just going to do this publicly so people see how easy it is. Can I just get... Where do you feel it's stuck? I just you want to keep yawning? Keep I yawning, that's how it comes out. Breathe yeah, breathe into it. Don't hyperventilate, it doesn't help. Okay, now, where the Word of God says in Luke that the eyes are, are light, so I look at her and my eyes are light and it freaks the demon out of her. That's the Word of God. That's why we do it with eyes open. Okay, so look at me. You may not own her any longer. And you are letting go of her right now quietly. And you are going to come up and out. You take a bit deep breath. You let her go. <coughs> Breathe. And out on her breath. Blow it out for me. All of it out. Look at me again. Okay. I'm just going to break something else. Where your family, look at me, where your family line partnered with silence and there was subjugation of the women that came to you, we even break the family line curse off you in the mighty name of Jesus. See, there it will go now. It was a family line issue. We break it. There we are. Okay. Now I'm going to get you to look at me and know. Off it comes. Okay, now that, that's just pain because there's a whole set of women oppressed in her family. That's all that is. So she is just weeping out pain for years as we break that curse. Don't you love how Jesus just sets people free in an instant? Okay? So now that we've broken the family line, we just now take the demon off. So I'm going to get you to stand up and look at me again. Oh, you look completely different. Okay. I think we've actually got it, but we'll just double check. Any last remnant of silence, off in Jesus' name. And one last blow of it out. Keep looking at me. You just got free. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. Good job. Woo! Did we get them all? Anybody else stuck? If you're stuck, come and see me in the break. Five minute, 10 minute comfort break. I was going to say on your marks, get set, run to the loo. But on you go, okay. Can I get... If you do not speak in tongues, come to the front now and we will sort that out. So can you just form an... Would you like to be a little bit more stretched? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. <laughs> Bring it on. Good stuff. So you are essentially a spirit. You happen to have a body, but you're essentially a spirit. 
and that spirit part of you will live forever. You are already bilocated, according to Ephesians. Where are you seated? In heavenly places. I don't know how that works. I think that's a weird bit of scripture. But you are right in the throne room of God, and you are also down here. And you are a spirit. That means you don't actually have to strain very hard to hear the business of heaven because it's easy for a spirit to be spiritual. And it's one of the great lies. I I struggle to be spiritual because I'm human. No, it's easy for you to be spiritual. You're already a spirit. Now, we're going to go this afternoon into some deeper waters. Um. 2 Corinthians 4.18, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, and what is unseen is eternal. It is a very peculiar mandate of heaven, fix your eyes on the unseen realm. What a command. You are supposed to see beyond what is natural, and you're supposed to see into the spirit realm. Fix your eyes on what is unseen. Colossians 3 verse 1 reinforces this biblical mandate. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Tell your neighbor, I am essentially a spirit. (laughs) Okay. And tell them, it's easy for me to be spiritual. (laughs) I tell you what, even that one decree alone, and why do I get you to say some things out loud? Because I've read uh, Job, and Job 22, 28, what does it say? Decree a thing, and it will be established. And sometimes you just need to say, it's easy for me to be spiritual, and then it's established. It's actually very straightforward. Okay, so God is communicating all the time, and our job is to learn how he does that. And Jesus does not say, excuse me, I'm about to speak. And God is not human, and his first language is not English. Unfortunately, it's not even Northern Irish. So we have got to learn how he communicates. And when I ring my husband, I don't say, David, it's your wife, Emma, the one you married 20 years ago. Do you remember? All I have to do is have him pick up the phone, and he knows by how I breathe that it's me and what is coming next by the breathing, okay? (laughs) And likewise, you've got to know God so well that you even know what a glance of his eye or a breath actually means. I think Hebrews 5.14 is one of the most outlandish of scriptures and it says this solid food and we're all like yes I'm up for some solid food is for the mature does it say solid food is for the mature who went to bible college no solid food is for the mature who were really good at attending all the church meetings solid food is for the mature who are intelligent solid food is for the mature get this who because of practice, have their senses, oh hang on a minute, senses, do you mean there's going to be encounter? Have their senses trained to discern good and evil. In other words, I practice with my senses to know what is God and what is not God. Practice means I'm not always going to get it right. But it is when my senses are trained that I am called biblically mature. It is in the training of my senses that I get solid food. Isn't that wild? Well, what does that mean? Do my children know that I love them because I've written it down? Often in notes in their lunch boxes or in Valentine's Day cards? Yes, they do. Just like I read scripture and know that I'm loved by God, they read my letters and they know that their mum loves them. But they also know the sight of love. 
They know when I look and what a love look looks like. They know the touch of love when I hold them. They know what it's like with the sound of my voice. They hear love. They know the smell of love. They know what my perfume smells like. And I say to them, I can smell naughtiness in the next room. And that used to work. And I could actually in the spirit. And... Uh, <laughs> So I'm serious about that. And they would, they would, now, they would now shout back, we're going to test your prophetic gift, mum. What sort of naughtiness do you smell? <laughs> okay. They know the taste of love, the taste of cooking, my favorite food. So when God trains your senses, you got to know what Jesus smells like. So Psalm 45 already tells you what he smells like, doesn't it? That he smells of myrrh and aloes and cassia. Song of Songs already tells you what his breath is like. That it smells like apples. So you know when God comes into a room and breathes, or when Jesus walks in, there's an associated biblical smell. Anybody smelt Jesus? One or two of you. My sheep know my voice. Taste and see that God is good. Communion all about eating and drinking. And so what I'm going to do now for the rest of our time together is to go down a list of the ways I think it's biblically normal for God to communicate. And this is not just all about, I'm going to train you to, to have a word, but we're really going to go into revelatory zones here. Are you okay with that? If you have any questions, ask your minister. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> he'll know the answers. So I want you to kind of tick a box and say, yeah, I think I do that one. I think that's a normal one for me. And where you don't, you're going to say, I think I've got some homework to do to be aware that that is biblically what God does. And I'm going to open my life to biblical normality and even biblical curiosity. Because I think we need a new level of biblical curiosity. We've got to read the book more. We've got to be excited by what it says. We've got to go, oh God, you say this. I'd like that in my life. I think we read the, the scriptures with too much of a familiar eye. And we need an anointing for biblical curiosity again. That's certainly my prayer continually. You know, I'm the daughter of a theologian and the Bible is well schooled in me. My husband is an intelligent, a biblical scholar as well. And we all pray for biblical curiosity. So the start point really for any revelatory journey, we'll name it number one, is just an impression or a sense. And it's not I heard and it's not I saw. It's just, I just, I don't know how to express it. I've got like a, I feel it in my waters. Okay. And I, I'm doing something by an unction of the spirit uh, I just had this gut feeling, and the Word of God says, don't despise the day of small beginnings, so we don't despise that this is our start point. Now, my husband and I, we used to live by Hamden, Scotland's national football stadium. My husband is devastated by its lack of use, that Scotland has not been in a national uh, uh, football tournament since 98, I think. Anyway, let's not have that conversation. It's very heartbreaking. So... Um, but it's a very steep hill. And I just felt like a, a, a nudge by the Spirit. Don't park your car outside your house. Park it at the top of the street. So I'm, oh, okay. I'll go and park it at the top of the street, God. The car in front of me, its handbrakes failed. And that car ping-ponged down the street and smashed every car apart from ours. And that's just a nudge of the Holy Spirit. So who's like, yeah, I think I get little nudges. I'm like, mm, I should drive a different way. I should have that phone call. I should, you know, okay, good. So you're already there. If you don't ask for them, can I tell you most of the prophets I meet, including Sam and I, we prophesy a lot on nudges. Wow. An awful lot of the time. We're just used to unpacking, uh, oh, I kind of feel this about you, okay? 
The next way God speaks is in pictorial visions. That sounds awfully grand, doesn't it? But it's just, I got a picture. It's a Holy Spirit visual aid. And it's important to ask the Holy Spirit what that means. I've done whole prophetic words on the Spirit of the Lord says, you are the roast potato, you are not the Brussels sprite, okay? (laughs) Whole words on that. We had a a team member, their child when they were very young, uh, would walk up to somebody and they would like almost like a Holy Spirit MRI scan. And they would scan down their body. They didn't know any body organs, but they would see a picture of an organ in the body go black. And they would know and point to exactly where that person was in physical pain. And when we adults prayed and the child joined in, when the organ turned green, the child knew that that person was healed. Okay, so picture visions. We used to have another team member who would just see some words written across people's foreheads and they would just know what was in their mind. Okay, so just having a picture. I had a whole, I was, I was feeding one of the children late one night when they were little and my friend came into my mind and she morphed into the purple one from Ch- Quality Streets, you know, the chocolate. <laughs> I like that one. And I'm thinking, I am so sleep deprived here. And the Lord says, no, it's a picture of her. And I'm like, the purple one from Quality Street? And the Lord says, yes, Emma, um, that's in scripture. And I'm like, oh, Jesus, help. (laughs) And uh, it's really got a nut inside, doesn't it? So there's a solid center, but it's easily squeezed on the outside. And the Lord says, that scripture is, you are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. And I'm like, oh God, you know, and we got a whole word on the purple run from Quality Street from that, from that picture. Okay, jump to your feet, find somebody you like the look of. You're going to practice a picture and an interpretation. And this comes from the Lord is showing me, or I am seeing Sam, (laughs) Sam hates this one. Sam, come and show us a picture and interpretation. (laughs) It's bubbling up, Sam. It's bubbling up, the picture. So have you got a partner? If you've not got a partner, put your hand in the air and walk towards another person with their hand in the air. Find a pal. Anybody not got a pal? Let me see you. Turn around. There's another man there with his hand up. And you walk towards each other. Now, let me just explain this. When I was pharmaceutical repping, they took us away, um, some team building exercise with a circus, circus trip. And uh, they taught us how to breathe fire, and they taught us how to cut through all those bricks, and they taught us how to juggle. And you know how competitive sales folk are. There was a thousand of us who couldn't juggle. And every time we dropped the ball, the language was getting bluer and bluer in the room. And the circus master said, whenever you drop the ball, you say, good learn. And every time we dropped the ball, it was good learn. So when you're practicing this, you have to have that mindset. I am learning and I'm going to be good at my learning. And if I fluff my lines, it's okay. When you first put a preacher in the pulpit, you do not expect him to be any good. It's nice if he is. Now, five years on down the line, you really are looking for some quality. Likewise with the prophetic gift, you don't expect to be in a 100 watt light bulb the day you start, do you? It has to be put in a context of practice and good learns. And the way we develop the 20 watt light bulbs, who often are quite rubbish, is not to shut them down, but to put a 100 watt light bulbs close to them to raise them up. You see that as the biblical model. There are always teams of prophets. You rarely ever see a prophet alone. And when they think they're alone, they're usually being told by God, no, there's a load in a cave. (laughs) They always have those they're raising up. Read scripture. 
You know, Nehemiah building a wall along with Ezra. Rarely ever alone. Okay, so you got a partner. Sam's going to give a picture and interpretation. Oh, you are. Yeah, I do hate it, but I'll do it anyway because I need to grow. Um, this lady here in the red, what's your name again? I know we just spoke. Natalie. So, Natalie, I just see a really simple picture of a dolphin just diving into the ocean. And the Spirit of God says to you, daughter, I have made you for several things. And the Lord says the first is to have an appetite and a desire for the deep places. But the Lord says the second is an ability to communicate in the deep and the dark places. And the Lord says to you, daughter, your life carries a resonance and it carries a sound that is heard in the darkness that attracts others that are like you, close to you. And the Lord says, daughter, there are periods of time where you come up for air to visit the high places but the Lord says this is the season where you intentionally dive deep but you start to open your mouth and you start to communicate and he says I like the sound of your voice and I like the sound of your spirit and the Lord says it carries the right tone to attract people and I can see you speaking to a very particular type of people, group of people, in some dark and mysterious places, and you're going to have the words and the sounds and the, the, the language to be able to communicate to them in a way that will attract them and pull them to you. Let me, let me simplify it. You're like a snooker table. Okay, simple picture. I'm not being all weird and Shakespeare, okay? Is it, you're a snooker table. And the Lord says... You've been trying for ages to line up the balls to pot them. And they were going all over the place and you felt like you had lost your edge. And the Lord says to you, you are about to have successive balls potted by single shots and successive victories. And the Lord says that edge that you know you have is rising again and you will have solution and completion and solution and completion, says God. Okay, so that's from a, a snooker table. All right, number yourselves one and two. One and two. Tell your neighbor, I give you permission to practice on me. And what do we do? We stir ourselves up by praying in the Spirit. And we go quiet. Shh, we go quiet. We're not receiving, we're perceiving. We're perceiving the picture that is already within because we are already one with the Spirit of God. Number one, you are starting. Open your eyes and give them the picture and tell them what it means. Make sure you swap over. Make sure you swap over.
Amen. And then when you're finished, you can have a seat. Amen. Have a seat. So, who was blessed by what was spoken over their lives? Yay! Who was shocked by what came out their own mind? <laughs> And now you're t let me see that again. Let me see. Okay, good. That is growth. That is growth. Well done. Okay. So the next level is closed panoramic visions. Again, very wordy title. Basically means my eyes are closed, closed, and the picture is moving. In other words, I've had an internal vision. Anybody had a vision? Internal vision. I close my eyes. Picture. Loads of you. Great. Box tick. Other of you ask for one. Then the next level is open panoramic vision. Very simple. My eyes are open and I'm seeing something move in my mind. We train our staff to do this. They are not allowed to minister ever with their eyes closed after a bit of a situation where one team member was prophesying over a client and the client was heavily demonized and was strangling the other team member. So <laughs> just keep your eyes open when you minister. All right. So closed. Then the next one. Now, you did give me permission to stretch you, didn't you? Because they get a little bit more intense. <laughs> Just warning you. And the next one is seeing in the spirit realm. Who sees angels or demons or Jesus or sees in the spirit realm? Oh, a good number of you. Okay. So the best biblical example of somebody who comes immediately into this gift would be Gehazi, Elisha's servant. And do you remember the army uh, of men and the king is coming against them and he's terrified, but Elisha says to him, do you not know that the army of the Lord is with us? And instantly Gehazi's eyes open and he sees in the spirit realm and he sees the army of the Lord. Okay, that is seeing in the spirit what angels do I see? What do I see Jesus doing? What hindrances do I see? What burdens and anointings do I see on somebody's life in the spirit realm? Now, the prophets are divided into two groups. The word prophets called Nabi, N-A-B-I, in the original. And that means they, that's Sam. That's why he doesn't like doing the pictures because he's not a, a seer prophet. He's a picture a word prophet. And so the Nabi prophets just gush with words. The seer or the chose prophets, they paint pictures. So when we list the seer or the sight prophets, we list people like Ezekiel. I saw wheels within wheels. I saw God seated on the throne outside the circle of the earth. Jeremiah is there too. Jeremiah, what do you see? I see an almond tree. Jeremiah, what do you see? I see a boiling pot from the north. Isaiah, another sight prophet, he is, by the way he describes, by his stripes we are healed, the imagery is so potent that you know he is seeing what is going to happen to Jesus. In the courts of King David, you read the scripture that there was Nathan the prophet and there was Gad the seer. It is written of Samuel that he was both a nabi, one who just had words, and one who could also see into the spirit realm. We also know Jesus could see in the spirit realm. I only do what I see the Father do. 
So we trained my children in this for years. By the activation, where is Jesus in the room? Endlessly. Where's Jesus in the room? Where's Jesus in the room? Where's Jesus in the room? We have the doctrine of the omnipresence of God, don't we? He's with, he's with us always. We also have the doctrine in Scripture of the Shekinah presence where he physically turns up. The Emmanuel, God with us. The I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. The doctrine of the Shekinah presence where Jesus presents himself. It's all scriptural. You actually see Jesus presenting himself in the Old Testament. It's called a Christophany. The angel of the Lord is often Jesus, so scholars tell us. So where's Jesus in the room? Where's Jesus in the room? To the point where my children would say, oh, mommy, Jesus has turned up and he's wearing his pajamas. And I'm like, hang on, theological problem here. Jesus doesn't slumber or sleep. And they're like, no, Jesus isn't going to sleep. Jesus is just going to get into my bed so he can give me a cuddle as I'm going to go to sleep. Okay? We got to a level with the children and they would say things to me like, mommy, why are all the angels in this shopping center crying today? I'd be like, oh, okay. I'll ask God. <laughs> all right? Seeing in the spirit realm. My friend would have me march up and down his street. He wasn't a seer prophet. And he would say to me, Emma, you see in the spirit. I want you to tell me where Jesus is standing in my street so that I go and knock on the door where he's standing because they're the people most right for salvation. We have trained many business people to look in their offices and say, Jesus, where are you standing in this office? Because where you're standing, there's going to be an open door for a healing or a miracle or a salvation. So I'm going to go and I'm going to stand where you're standing right now. Many salvations have come through people. No, not everybody has the gift of sight. But a lot of folk in scripture have, and it's very biblically normal. Okay, so it got to the point where I think Peter, my middle boy, um, he was in nappies and we were visiting a church and they had a soft play area and a ball pit and I was doing the kind of like nappy change and then sending him off to the ball pit to play. And he came back in and he said, mommy, mommy, there's, there's spiders in the ball pit. And I'm saying to them, are they real or are they spiritual? I'm going to train them. So he said to me, no, mommy, they're demonic spiders. And I said, well, have you told them to go away in Jesus' name? Because you've got to teach that fairly early on. And he says, I already tried that, mommy, and they didn't go. You need to come and do it. So if he was in nappies, he must have been two, two or three, young. And uh, so I go in and I'm like, oh, man, there are loads of demonic spiders in this ball pit. And there is a large demon in the corner that they're all coming off. And it's a demon of sexual perversion and so I think oh I don't think I can clean that one out I think that's got permission to be in this church so I go to the minister who has no grid of reference for this and doesn't really know me and I say to him you've got a spiritual perversion demon in your children's ball pit <laughs> and he's going hmm, you know and I say to him I actually believe you have a higher instance of uh, pornography marriage breakdown adultery gender issues because some way that was let into the building and not repented of and not dealt with and he said yes it's crippling my ministry the amount of sexual perversion in this church and he said one of my elders was downloading pornography in the place where that ball pit is we did not deal with it we did not repent and we moved him out and we made his office into the creche I helped him, led him in a prayer to renounce and deal with that sin in the church. That demon went and he reported to me over the weeks that followed miraculous healings in marriage. And that whole church got saved over a child in nappies who knew how to see wow. in the spirit realm. My daughter came to me once and she said, Mommy, I'd like to massage you. And I'm like, Jessica, you don't know how to massage. Jesus taught me, she said. 
<laughs> I'm like, how did he do that? She said, I heard you teach. She said, I didn't understand it, but I heard you teach on the laying on of hands and how it's, you know, is a basic doctrine from Hebrews 6. And she said, I asked Jesus, how could I lay hands on my school friends so that they would get saved? And Jesus said, you lie them on the AstroTurf pitch in school in threes. You look in the spirit realm on where I put my hands to massage them. You massage them. And Jesus taught Jessica to massage. And all her friends got saved. Seeing in the spirit realm. There is a New Zealand prophet, a guy called Neville Johnson, who writes about the barrier between the natural and the supernatural completely disintegrating for three months. Uh, it, it nearly happened to my assistant director. She's our lead seer. Um, uh, it was mind-blowing what she sees in the spirit realm. Uh, but it, he said that you could just see uh, emotions as colors like fear. Uh, and he, he struggled to keep sane. Uh, but he said things like fear would travel for miles at a time off people. And so actually we ask very low grade, immature questions, you know, can a demon read my mind? And he said it, it, it just wasn't even a question because we were all emanating emotions and colors in the spirit. It was very easy for the spirit realm to read and understand what was going on with us. Am I blowing your mind yet? I told you. The opposite of this in the New Age world, who steal from Scripture, and it's time we get it back, is to open the all-seeing third eye and to partner with demonic information. Okay, so if that's in your family line, get some anointing oil, put it on your third eye. I say, I close my third eye. I only want to see what Jesus wants to show me. I don't want to look at the nonsense stuff. You should only be seeing the demon if you're doing deliverance ministry or building cleanse. There's no other need for you to be looking at demons. Who wants to anyway? Where is Jesus in the room? Shall we practice? Close your eyes. Close your eyes to see, but you know what I mean. Close your eyes. Jesus, where are you in the room? So, Father, I just want to pray over them Ephesians and Ephesians 3, where it says that the, to open the eyes of our heart. So, Father, I release an Ephesians blessing that the eyes of their heart would now be opened. And we release the ability for supernatural spiritual sight. So when the New Testament says, fix your eyes on the unseen, that there would be the ability to be biblically normal right now. So where is Jesus in the room? Keep your eyes closed, my family, okay? And I want you to just get a sense of it. He's not in your heart. We've already told you that doesn't happen. So nobody tell me in your heart. And when you get a sense, even if you think, oh, is this a good learn moment? Am I guessing or is this real? You just say, Jesus, if that's not you, take it away. Jesus, if that is you, would you bring that into greater focus? And Jesus if it's okay with you, would you walk towards me? Jesus, even would you put your hand on me that I might be with you in this moment and let Jesus just move. Keep your eyes closed. If you think, oh help, I can't see anything, do not open your eyes. Just put your hand up and we will release that because this is very new. Um, just wait till Sam or I come. So we release the ability to see in the spirit right now in Jesus' name. Now, I know this is very new for a lot of you. It's totally biblical. Jesus only does what he sees the Father do. 
And then those of you who are already there, I want you to say to Jesus, how much do you love me? And allow the love of God, allow the love of God to be spoken and sensed and felt as Jesus stands with you. Loose spiritual sight. We loose all of those. I may not be able to reach all of you in the row, middle of rows. We loose spiritual sight right now. And then Jesus, do you have anything you want to give me? And then let Jesus give you Some of you might just sense it rather than seeing because this is your first time. Some of you will be like, oh, I think I sense that he is there. So the rest of you who are already on it is, I, what do you want to give me, Jesus? And receive whatever gift and say to him, why are you giving me this, Jesus? Okay, and then when you're ready, you can just come back, open your eyes, be aware that you're back in the room. And, okay. Who is like, yuck, don't ever make me do that again? Oh, nobody's like, I hate that exercise. <laughs> okay. Who's like, mm, I kind of struggled. It wasn't my natural way to sense revelation. That's okay. That's okay. It's just a practice like I did with my children. Where are you, Jesus? Where are you, Jesus? He only does what he sees the Father do. Okay. Who's like, I am so there. I was there immediately and I saw. Okay. So actually a good number of you. A fair uh, a smattering for both of those. Anybody want to share what they did see? Use your hand straight up. Talk to me. You felt Jesus immediately there. Yeah. Putting his hand on you. Feel it. I could physically feel his hand on me. And then he gave me a pearl. And I said, what's this pearl for? And he said, it's a pearl of great wisdom. Wow. And did you sense any colors or? I just saw the pearl that was huge beautiful and when jesus when you asked jesus how much do you love me what did you hear he's he just put his arms out and said i died for you and how do you feel after that well <laughs> completely blown away okay okay good stuff one more person yes paul i felt jesus was over sort of where those lights were whether it was the lights but that was this is the minute that you sort of said where's jesus and i felt him walk over towards me and when I asked him um, how much she loved me, the, just the words gushing, gushing, came from when I was, felt emotional. And I asked him, what do you want to give me? And he said, I want to give you an, give you an eternity ring because you need to know that you're in my eternal plans. Okay, wow. Wow, good stuff. Okay, so lots of practice. I would suggest you practice even in the car. Jesus, where are you in this car? That's an easy one. There's probably only four seat options. Okay. <laughs> So I'm mindful of time. Let me give you two more. I do have a list of about 13, but I'll give you two more. The ways that uh, the revelatory realm opens up to us. The other next one is dreams. And you know that Daniel and Joseph would be the biblically leading exponents of that. Uh, anybody dream a lot? Oh, good. You do know what the book of Job says, that all dreams are sent from God? You do know that? And it says in Job, I speak once in a dream, I speak twice in a dream, I speak three times in a nightmare.
So not all your nightmares are deliverance issues. Night terrors are different. They are demonic. But nightmares are God saying, you did not listen the first couple of times I spoke. Read the book of Job. So most of you will need two things by your bed, a dream interpretation dictionary. There are some great ones around. We uh, recommend a couple. And uh, also a journal that you start to write down what God is saying in the night. God has me flying around in red telephone boxes in the night. He's got me soaring over nations, seeing what he's doing in different lands so I can pray better. Uh, uh, He's got me healed in my dreams. You know, when you go to bed at night and you are feeling emotionally wrong, and you know that God puts a dream of healing in your spirit and you wake up emotionally well? Anybody had that? The power of dreams. Okay, so if you want more dreams, put your hands up and say, God, I, you know, let's just grab hold of it. Father, I lose the ability to dream more. If it's how you speak, I want it, God. I don't want to miss your ways of revelation. Amen. audible voice of God. Who's heard the audible voice of God? Oh, actually that's more than normally answer that question. You know it's all the way through scripture. God speaks, you know, Jesus' baptism and so on and so on. And uh, I remember the very first time I ever heard the word of God. And I was over in Spain. My parents pastored a church in Spain for about a decade. And I'd been warring a demon on their land, doing land cleansing in the middle of the night and everybody else was in bed. And I'd come in to go to sleep and I'd been talking to uh, my guardian angel about, I can't even remember what. And so I go to sleep and I'm meditating on my favorite scripture. I don't know why it's my favorite scripture. It just is. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of our God from Psalm 46. And I'm like, God, I really want to be a river or a stream that always flows towards your holy city, that always makes you glad. I fall asleep. God wakes me up and he says to me, you are a river that makes me glad. And rather than going, oh, 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 sorry, the voice of God cuts right through and there is utterly no denying it. So if you think you've sort of maybe kind of heard the voice of God, may I kindly suggest you have not. But we have to know that these things are in scripture. Finally, and then we'll take questions. Angels. It is biblically normal to interact with the angelic. Tell me how many times are tongues mentioned in scripture? Twelve. And you know you have doctrines on the gift of tongues. And church splits over the gift of tongues. And it's in there twelve times. How many times is Gideon laying a fleece before the Lord? Once. And you know we've all done that. We've got, oh God, you know my hanging basket. I know all the flowers in it are dead. But if they're amazingly resurrected by the time I come home, I know it'll mean you want me to do this. Yeah? Okay, we've all prayed that kind of prayer. Once. How many times are angels mentioned in scripture? 300. How many of those do you think they are talking to men? 104. It is more normal biblically to have a conversation with an angel than it is to speak in tongues. Oh, ho, ho. And we know that angel activity increases at the end times, and we need to be prepared for more angel interactions. Isaiah, there are so many categories of angels. We do teach on it for about four or five hours. So many categories of angels. But one in Isaiah 63 talks about the angels of his presence. Don't you love that? Now, they're probably better than the angels of destruction you read about in Sodom and Gomorrah. What about the Psalm 91 angels, the hider angels who hide you? There's loads. There's loads of categories. 
Hebrews 1, it says that angels are sent to minister to those who will inherit salvation. Anybody Christian in the room? That means, according to Hebrews 1, you already have an angel who is ministering to you. You just haven't seen it. Oh. And very often after we've done a long day of, or ministry, the angels will just turn up and I see them in the spirit and they just start to tend to me and they'll pour things in or they'll take things off. That is biblically normal, the ministry of angels. So let me tell you two stories and then we'll take questions. I was actually telling these guys at dinner last night, we're staying with them. My friend Jim, uh, he lives in Ohio. He uh, ran a healing ministry out there. And he said to me, Emma, I was in my bed one night and the angel... Uh, an angel turned up and shook me awake and said, my name is Revelation. And Jim said, I don't know that there is an angel category called the angels of Revelation in scripture. And he, the angel got quite a bit uh, narked with him and said, I was there in Patmos giving revelation to John. I was there when Jesus was a boy and a carpenter's son. And Jim went, oh, okay. And this angel of Revelation started to give him words about his life. And he wrote them all down. And he said, I went back to sleep and an angel, a demon woke me up and physically shook me and said, my name is accusation and started to bring a whole book from out behind his back where all of Jim's sins were listed and the demon of accusation started to read them to him. He said the angel of revelation reappeared, took the same book from out behind his back, but his were dripping with blood. And he said, my master has dealt with the original and turned into summer Rambo and, uh, uh, and, ki and killed, uh, uh, sent the demon packing. I have so many angel stories. Let me tell you one, and then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, my husband and I uh, were going out for a meal one night to a restaurant. A friend was with us. I'd had a strong man demon follow me around all that day. And it, I wasn't particularly bothered. I'd worshipped and prayed. And I felt like God say to me, uh, just see what's going on in darkness over Glasgow. I want you to teach some things. So you need to know what the stronghold of the enemy is in this region right now. That's very normal when I travel. God will show me this, the angel of the region. Now, where is that in scripture? It's in Revelation to the angel of the church in you, you know that every, every church has an, an angel. You've read that in Revelation. You've read about the territorial church angels. Come on, read the book, you guys. Don't look so stunned. <laughs> to the angel of the church. All right. And you already know that there are demonic principalities as well. You only have to read Daniel uh, 7, 8, and 9 to know about the demon over the region of the Prince of Persia or the demon over Greece. Come on. You already know that our wrestle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and so on. You know from the original text that the word principality refers to territorial regional demons. Do the study. Right. So the demon is there and he is really starting to act up and I'm thinking, oh, I really don't want to have to do major warfare or bind it in the middle of the restaurant. So I turned to my guardian angel, my Hebrews one, I just told you about them, the angels who minister to the heirs of salvation, read the book. And I'm about to have a conversation to say, what are we going to do about this? Because he's, I just want to eat my dinner. And um, he puts his wings up. And from that moment, we go completely invisible. Psalm 91, wow. hide your angels. Some of you are looking like you've not read the same book I've read. So 
we don't get any food we have ordered. I have to go to the hatch in the kitchen and get the food that we've ordered. They clear up the restaurant. Everybody goes home. The chairs are on top of the table. They are mopping the floor, and it's just the three of us there. The demon goes. The hider angel puts down his wings, and all of the staff gather round, and they say, how long have you been here? You were completely invisible all night. You are sitting at our prime table, and not a single single member of staff has seen you. We thought this table was vacant. How did you even get your food? And I'm thinking, how am I ever going to explain <laughs> about the hide or angel situation we've just had? So we just paid politely and left. So many stories. I want to say to you, there's more. There's third heaven encounters. There's being caught up in the spirit. There's biblical trances. I don't have time to go through the list and unpack it all scripturally. There's times when your body moves uh, supernaturally, like Philip who was moved from one place to another. There's times when your spirit travels, like Ezekiel. He was caught up in the spirit. Many biblical greats were caught up in the spirit. But I want to say to you this, we do not go after experience for experience sake. We go after the encounter with God that we may know our God more, that revelation is our normal culture. And actually, we're not that impressed by it. And I don't tell you these stories for to be impressed. I tell you these stories because I am so desperate that you come into a place of biblical normality and of revelation. And let me tell you this, every single time I have flown in the spirit or traveled to heaven or worked with the angels or heard the audible voice of God, let me tell you what it does. It creates in me, as it will in you, a new level of holy miserableness because you start to see the holiness of your God and you start to realize, though you have given him your heart, how painfully disconnected and divided your heart is when you see greatness like that, when God picks you up and travels you around and says, you better work with the angels. And I believe the church is about to come awake to the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation. And when, when Revelation 19 talks about the spirit of prophecy, that that is about to descend and that en masse, you're going to start to experience the way the, the, the people in scripture experience their God. And I used to say to my dad when he was driving me to to, to church, his church. Dad, why is your church not like what I read in scripture, Dad? Why is it boring? My poor father. Oh, he longs to pick us up in the ways that are his. So why don't you stand? I'm going to pray for you. Oh, actually, only stand up if you want me to bless you into a revelatory lifestyle. I don't want you to stand up if you're like really unsure of this. Please, because I know we have our own journeys and I grew up Irish Baptist and my husband grew up free Presbyterian. He only sung unaccompanied psalms in church in Gaelic often. He thought drum kits were possessed of the devil. He's gone a journey. Sam, you grew up strict brethren. We, we know what the journey is like. We, none of us were born charismatic. In fact, very, very far from it. We are scholars of the word, and I hope that comes across first and foremost before we are anything else. Raise your hands up so that you might catch this. Oh, Jesus, we're so hungry. We're so hungry for the even the extremes of who you are. Father, we're so hungry to swim in the waters of biblical normality. Father, we are biblically curious. What is it like when you say that we can be made alive in Christ in Ephesians and Colossians? What does that look like, God? 
Father, what does it look like when my senses are trained? What does that feel like to, be, to know what you taste like and smell like and sound like and feel like? Oh God, we want to know. And so in the name of Jesus, I loose you into the waters of revelation right now in Jesus' name. And even though you may go in with a small toe in a shallow end, I begin in the name of Jesus by this commissioning of you into the pool that and the ocean that God has made of how he communicates and how he meets with his people. And I bless you to have a lifestyle of lingering for you do not get this on the run. And we even open the heavens with our prayers over this region. That there may be angels who come down and ascend and descend. That there would even be the open heaven of encounter and revelation. And we rend the heavens. And the Lord says back to us, as you rend the heavens, as I rend the heavens, you rend your hearts. And so we partner with open heaven by rending our hearts and saying, God, we make a space for you, even if it shocks us, and even if it's out of our current paradigm, in Jesus' name, amen. Have a seat. I know we're 12 minutes over. Thank you for giving me grace. Would Quick questions, is that okay? Quick questions, because I know some of you will be like burning with questions. No question is a foolish question, really, when we're in this. Yes, my lovely. Oh, thank you. When you ask us to pray for ourselves, why do you ask us to put our hands on our stomach and our tummy rather than like on our heart or our head? Prophetic acts are very important in scripture. And do you remember when the king goes to Elisha and he's told to, to to whack the arrows on the grind and he's a bit lightweight and lily livered about it and you know and so the Lord says to him that's you know Elijah Elisha says to him that's pathetic I paraphrase and you will not get the level of victory because you were not engaged in the prophetic act and so sometimes laying our hands on on places is is a, an important prophetic act that God releases blessing when we do those activations you better thank God that the prophetic act was not a Jeremiah prophetic act because he hid his underwear behind a stone for months and then had to go and retrieve it or even or even like Ezekiel and Isaiah who had to lie naked on their side and preach naked or cook their food over human poo okay so just be grateful that it was a put your hand on your tummy prophetic act. It's a weird book. It's a weird book. Yes. Why? Because I feel like there's something that God is saying that is to erupt. Why? Because the spirit, you are one with the spirit of God, aren't you? And so we're opening up your spirit to work with the spirit realm. Okay, next question. Yes. Uh, you know, it can be, um, okay, so when, when our lives can be sometimes uh, really busy, and although God should be, like, um, main, you know, yeah, um, <laughs> he, um, ha have you got any tips on how we can make sure we put aside time uh, to practice the prophetic? Oh, making, I have to say, the brilliant question, my lovely. It is a lifestyle, and it is not, I, I, we stopped using the word quiet time. For a time, we had quiet time, and then we realized that's ridiculous. There's nothing quiet about it. We'll call it joy time, and then we realized that was equally ridiculous because it's not a time. That's an Old Testament concept. In the Old Testament, I'm about booking an appointment with God. I have to book to come. And we have that mindset, I'm going to book to come to God. Whereas in the New Testament, it's all the time. And so what we train our staff to do is that the last thing they hear before they go to sleep is the voice of God. They're conscious of, I'm lying in bed, God, what are you saying? They wait to tell, Samuel, uh, uh, Sam, grab the mic and tell them what you do in the morning, your morning uh, routine, so that we're even awakening our spirit when we get up. So I 
Am I on? I do three things every single morning, have done for four years. The first thing is I pray in tongues for 15 to 20 minutes. The second thing is I pray, you know, Jesus, I want to be a good representation of you today. And I deal with anything in that moment that would hinder me from being a good representation to Jesus. And the third part, which is the most important, is I pray Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16. And it talks about, I'll paraphrase it, that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you in your inner man. And it talks about what God has put in your spirit, coming up and overflowing into your heart, your mind, your emotions, and then all of your body. And I call my body my emotions, my mind, to be submissive to what is in my spirit and start to live a spirit-led life. So that is every single morning without, like, I've never not done it, actually. I pray in, in the shower in tongues every morning. You, you go to, and, and so, God, I want to hear your voice today. And I think when you start the day like that, you live the day in that revelatory mindset and it's all day. You do have to have retreat seasons where it's extended, but it's a lifestyle of revelation. And you're learning all of the time how to have two conversations at once. Constant conversation with God and a conversation with the person in front of you. Next question. Yes. Open for all of this. So, how can you be open to, um, I'm 100% I'm open for all of it and more. How can you be open to all of that and not feel like you're going, going mad or developing a mental health condition. Okay, so the safeguard is written in Corinthians. It's one of the gifts, and it's called the gift of the discerning of spirits. It is one of the most important but overlooked gifts, and you have to ask for it before you go on a revelatory journey. Sam and I both teach at some length uh, on the discerning of spirits, because name me the three types of spirit there are. Holy, with angels, human, and demonic. So you've got to know what's going on. And so God, give me the gift of the discerning of spirits that I might know whether this is demonic and I shut it down, whether it's my own nonsense and human and I medicate that and tell myself to grow up and stop doing that, or whether this is from you. Okay, so that is the major safeguard gift that must run alongside all of Revelation. Next question. I sometimes get confused about the value of being really quiet before the Lord. And often when I start like that, I end up praying in tongues quite a lot. And yeah. I think, well, should I go back to being silent? Mm -hmm. um, could you just speak a little bit about that? Yeah, Teresa of our villa was the big exponent, wasn't she? One of the Christian mystics uh, of the devotions of silence. And uh, it's, a great, it's a great discipline to have. And, and she talks about the devotion of silence so taking over her life that, um, that she would feel like she became one with God in the silence. And actually, there wasn't the Protestant church when she was around. She was so one with God in the silence, she would be seen levitating in mass frequently I don't know what the priest did with that but as, Je but as Jesus floated in the sky I would have thought she's got bi biblical precedent but anyway um, I would have said silence it is very very important I think as prophetic people that we don't talk over what God is revealing before he has finished and we add our own interpretation onto it because it's very easy to see well I see a dog that means God must be saying you're faithful whereas God could be saying actually you're quite yappy and you need to be quite do you know and and we we butt in too quickly and I think it's a very I don't know that that helps answer your question but I think it's really important to learn how to be silent before God yes at the back. Um, so, just in relation to that question, just in relation to that question, um, I try a lot to be silent, but there's also the verse about, in the Bible, about how the, an idle mind is the devil's workshop, so I don't understand quite if you're meant to be completely silent, or basically how to prevent your idle mind when you're silent from becoming a devil's workshop. 
I, I have to say, I'm not, very, I'm not the one to ask on silence. I have to say, it's not my real strength of a discipline. You might have spotted that. Uh, I, I do keep a page beside me that every time there's other thoughts, I just write them down um, uh, uh, as I go. And that's a top tip. You have to learn to manage your mind. And if, if it's not working, get up and do high praise instead and come back to it. These are muscles that you exercise, like prophecy, silence, worship. They are all muscles. So if you can only do five minutes in silence, do five minutes in silence, and then do six minutes the next time. But don't say, oh, I'm, I'm going to prophesy for an hour when you've never done it before, or I'm going to sit in silence for an hour when you've never done it before. You know, we have to grow our muscles in all of these things. Okay, a couple more questions. Maybe on the prophetic, something I might know about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, this is just something that's happened today. Um, you have confirmed three pictures that I've had while, we've been, while you've been talking. Um, what would you say to people when they have a picture, when a pastor is going to say something, you know it before he says it? You're just revelatory. So you would, you would not bring it to that pastor. You would tell the pastor afterwards that that is something that um, you agree with because God's laid it on your heart as well. Is that... Look, when you're revelatory, you see all sorts of things. You see the bad and you learn not to look at that. You see things ahead of time because you're prophetic. Just because we see it doesn't mean I always have to share it. And the word of God says that the, the words of the prophets are subject to the will of the prophet. And therefore, I don't just gush with revelation every time I fancy, but I actually maturely steward it so that what I speak is mature, well thought through. It comes through a lens of my discipline that actually just because I see, I don't need to speak about that. And that I hold it sometimes like Mary did and ponder it in my heart. And I go, oh, I just saw that because... I'm revelatory in orientation. And, and part of the problem, I think, in the church is when people get opened up to revelation, they just share everything like a machine gun. And we all go, what on earth is all of that? Because half of it is not mature and half of it is for pondering in your heart. Okay? So, but you will see a lot. And that's the joy of growing in the gift to go, I see that. I'm ignoring that. I see that depression in the room. I'm not going after that today. It's not the day for that. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, good. Maybe one more question. I know we're pushing time. Yeah, the lady in the stripy top beside you. As someone who's just starting to explore the prophetic, yes. what would you recommend of how to practice? Okay, you have to practice. And the practice has got to stretch you. So what I tend to say is, you know Malcolm Gladwell, the New York commentator, writes in, in his book about 10,000 hours being the number of greatness, that any musician or chess master has done 10,000 hours of practice before they hit the number of greatness. Now, Graham Cook would say it takes 14 years from the call of a prophet until that prophet is anyway useful to the body of Christ and is mature and we're looking at scriptures there from where Paul is called to where he hits extraordinary miracles in Acts 19 they reckon that's 14 years they also reckon the same of King David that it takes a period of maturity between anointing and actually sitting on the throne so within that period you are going to be what we would call um, an emerging prophetic voice it is not till after about year 14 that anybody would call you established, just so we all know. Uh, but your practice, this 10,000 hours of greatness, let's try 10 minutes a day. Find something to prophesy over every day. So when I'm walking our dog, Joy, our Labrador dog, Joy, I am prophesying to the trees. And I am saying, even though I've 
and practice. I'm saying, trees, do you know what God is going to do in this region? Grass, you better hear the word of the Lord as I'm in the park. When I was medical repping and driving the car, I would drive past somebody. I was never going to see them. I didn't know who they were, but they'd catch my eye. I'd drive on and I would practice my prophetic language uh, and prophesy over them, though I would never meet them. So when I had a live human being, I actually knew what my voice in prophecy sounded like. When you're hoovering, prophesy to your carpet, okay? But you need to find people with flesh eventually. And I, what I say to my team is, you go to the checkout operator and you say, do you have three children? And they'll go like, no. And they don't, you, they don't need to know that you are practicing revelation. But if it's a yes, you go, oh, I was just practicing hearing the voice of God. I think he's also saying this. It is... It, it, you have to be intentional. So much fun. I think, is that probably us? Great stuff. Come on and show our appreciation. Brilliant. What a, what a tremendous afternoon, eh? We started off by saying we're up to be stretched. Have you been stretched? Yeah. Good. God's in that. God's in the stretch. And what, I, what I've loved about so many of the illustrations today is that, you know, as a pastor of a church, I often get people say, um, where can we have space to prophesy? And it always seems to get interpreted to a public gathering. You know, please, in front of 500 people on a Sunday, can I give my first prophecy? All the illustrations have been about real life, real world, outside of the walls of the church. So... If you've got frustrations with your pastor, if you're from other churches, if you've gone with me, come and talk to me direct. But if you've got, if you have frustrations with your pastor, say, you never give me space to move in the prophetic, you need to apologize before God. Because you're wanting to do it in a public, in this space, and not practice it in the other space. And you need to step out in those areas. So your homework is not to go to your pastor tomorrow and say, I've been to a prophetic conference and I want to practice now. Um, you know, I know you've spent 12 hours preparing your word, but I want to just interrupt the service and I want to just bring a word. It's going to be my first attempt and you get up and you share something that's your first go. No, you go and you practice with the people that you encounter when you leave this building. Are we up for that? Because I tell you what, that's what changes the world. That's what see the glory of the Lord come into our nation. Emma and Sam, thank you so much for blessing the socks off us today. It's been amazing. Amazing. Please send our greetings if you're from other churches to your leaders. It's been a joy to share this day with you. Thank you for being with us. If you're from here, we have Emma and Sam with us again tomorrow, both services, and we're looking forward to that. But Lord bless you. Have a great rest of the day, and go prophesy in Jesus' name. Amen.